and I'm honoured to be able to introduce our three guest uh, lecturers today. Uh, I advise you to listen carefully uh, to what they're telling you, not only things about themselves and about the company that they represent, uh, which is Fidelity Investments, uh, but about the overall counsel and direction uh, that they're going to give and try to apply that into your lives individually. In order, unlike my papers, which were not quite in order there, Lori Smith is currently a service director for Fidelity Investments and is the branch office manager over the American Fork location. She's been with Fidelity for 17 years, during which time she's held multiple roles within various parts of the organization, namely services, or sorry, service, sales, and high net worth groups. Within these groups, her roles have been centered around management, project work, and strategic planning. She's worked in various locations, Merrimack, New Hampshire, Smithfield, Rhode Island, Boston, Massachusetts, and Salt Lake City, Utah. Lori has a Bachelor's of Science in Economics from the University of Utah. She also holds her Series 6, 7, 63, and 8 licenses. Carlos Lopez is the Vice, Pres Vice President and Regional Planning Consultant for Fidelity Investments in Utah and Idaho. Carlos specializes in retirement income planning and estate and legacy planning. Carlos is responsible for the sales and distribution of products and services in the Utah and Idaho Fidelity branches. Mr. Lopez began his career at Fidelity in 1993. Over the past 17 years, he has also held a number of positions with Fidelity. Uh, he has worked in their retail sales division, distribution, and investor center network. For the last five years, Carlos has worked closely with account executives in these branches and with, uh, also with training and mentorship, mentorship. Mr. Lopez holds a Bachelor's of Science degree in business finance and is a board-approved certified financial planner. Uh, he is currently pursuing a master's degree in business administration at Westminster College. He lives in Salt Lake City with his wife, Christy, and two daughters. Finally, Rob Witt is a branch manager of the new Fidelity Investments Orem Investment Center, uh, which provides customers with education, state-of-the-art technology, and one-on-one -on -one guidance to help them develop strategies for, for a variety of financial goals. Mr. Witt began his career with Fidelity in 2000, and during the last 10 years has also held a number of roles within Fidelity's retail sales and distribution and investor center network. Before recently opening the new Orem office, Mr. Witt spent three years at Fidelity Salt Lake City Investor Center as a regional consultant, focusing on supporting client needs across Utah and Idaho. Mr. Witt holds both a Bachelor's of Arts degree in Communication Studies and a Master's of Business Administration from Brigham Young University. He has successfully completed the Series 7, 9, 10, 63, and 66 examinations and holds a Utah insurance license. Please listen carefully. Again, Lori. Thank you, Jacob. Uh, I uh, actually occurred to me while you were reading my bio that today is the anniversary. I was hired on this day 17 years ago at Fidelity Investments. Um, the other thing that occurred to me is, as he was reading my bio, that uh, after the game this past weekend, I was hoping that Randy might not mind me actually transferring from the University of Utah to now to UVU. Um, it was a little bit of a trouncing, as you all know. What a privilege to speak with you today. Um, as mentioned, my name is Lori Smith, and I am the director, uh, one of the service directors at Fidelity Investments, and I'm the branch office manager over American Fork. And let me explain to you a little bit about what that means. Uh, currently at American Fork, we have about 200 licensed brokers. In fact, everyone within that location is required to have their financial services licenses that allows them to interact in the way that we want them to uh, with our client base. Um, the capacity of the site is around 300, and um, I would say based on projections and household growth, we're looking at um, the opportunity of filling up that location within the next year with some pretty stiff hiring plans in front of us for Q1. 
Uh, as far as um, what I wanted to share with you today, even furthermore in my role outside of the hiring and the staffing and the health, just overall health of the American Forks site, I wanted to share a little bit about my story. And as I thought through uh, my story and uh, how to best get that across um, uh, what I found at Fidelity to, to lead me through my success, I, I think what it came down to is a couple of specifics around um, trying to portray the story of who Fidelity as a company is and what that's meant to me. So let's start a little bit around um, uh, Fidelity Investments and who are they? And I think if you look and think about just the name itself, it somewhat defines Fidelity for me. Um, Fidelity stands for trust, integrity, and commitment. And those things, as, as you know, have certainly held Fidelity in, in well stead um, over the past several years and, uh, and through the market chaos that we've all felt in 2008. I would say the other thing that I uh, love about working for Fidelity and that, um, that you should know about the company is that it's privately held. So in 1946, Edward C. Johnson founded FMR, Fidelity Management Research, um, and founded them as a privately held entity. And uh, uh, for that, I think, um, brings many advantages. One of the main advantages that we've seen uh, has been the fact that we are not held to shareholder demand. And so um, that's one thing that I'd want you to note is shareholder demand is a big piece of private versus public. Um, if we think again to that market chaos that we all are still feeling from 2008, let me explain a little bit more about what I mean. So in 2008, we saw the S&P drop in August. I would say around, closed around 1274 in August, uh, dropped over a six-month period to close in February at about uh, 666, so bad number, 666. And it did that over about a six-month time frame. Um, and that was about a 49% decline. We also had to lead quite significantly um, through this challenging environment um, uh, with respect to um, big swings in the market throughout that time. So, uh, for example, in October of 2008, we saw a decline of about 200 points or a 20% drop um, just within six days. So you can imagine what that does to the um, to the clients who do business with you and to we saw what that did as a whole to the country. So I'll uh, speak a little bit more to exactly what happened there and remind you a little bit of that time. So um, if you'll recall brokerage houses that had been in business for over a hundred years all of a sudden found themselves uh, overnight seemingly bankrupt. We had TARP legislation that was being pushed quickly through um, just based on the fact that capital markets were freezing. Uh, we had billions being, um, billions being loaned to failed insurance companies and automakers. Unemployment skyrocketed as uh, layoffs became a common theme in the news. Foreclosures climbed as our marking housing uh, environment imploded. Am I painting a pretty picture for you? And then very last of all, I can't go without saying, and Madoff was arrested, right? So uh, what that hopefully paints for you is a situation where I feel uh, working for a company like Fidelity has really uh, led me, and I felt very confident during that time in knowing that I worked for a firm that believed in being the most trusted provider for their clients and upheld that integrity, and that kept them in good stead during that time. Another thing to note about Fidelity is that we really believe in innovation. So I'm going to provide you with a few facts and examples of, of that innovation in the mutual fund in industry throughout the years. Uh, I'll go back to 1974 and uh, mention, so uh, at that time we were the first company to uh, let consumers write checks on their money market funds. That same year, we leveraged, uh, for the first time ever, we leveraged direct sales through advertising and an 800 toll-free number. In 1979, we provided, for the first time in the industry, 24-hour access for clients via an automated phone system. In 1986, we were the first mutual fund company to offer credit cards. 
in 1995, we were the first fund to be out there on the World Wide Web. In 2007, we had a couple significant um, uh, releases. We were the first to develop income replacement funds, and we were also the first to provide uh, tr free trade strategy backtesting. And Carlos can speak more to those if you want more details on those. So all of this, to me, speaks to a couple of things. It speaks to why I've stayed with Fidelity for 17 years, the opportunities that I've found um, presented to me. It also speaks to why we find Fidelity uh, in a position as the largest mutual fund company in the United States and one of the largest providers uh, across the um, world in the financial services industry. So. Um, I found a very interesting factoid uh, as I was preparing for this. Uh, currently, assets under administration, total assets, are $3.2 trillion. It's a really difficult number to sort of get your arms around. 3.2, what does that mean? So I did a quick math calculation and uh, found out um, that if each of us, well, not each of us, if you spent a million dollars a day you would not run out of money for 8,767 years. That's how big $3.2 trillion are. We're also the number uh, one leader in retirements. So that means we're the number one provider of 401ks. We're the number one provider of IRAs. Fidelity provides health and welfare, defined contribution, defined benefit, stock plan services to over 16,000 employers. And then very last of all, we're the number one in brokerage customers. So hopefully, you'll see if you package all this together, you'll quickly understand how easy it is for someone such as myself to really find a lot of opportunity and a lot of career growth through a company like Fidelity. There is one last thing that I would add, and you heard Jacob mention it. Fidelity has uh, definitely provided an opportunity to move around and to uh, really get your arms around different roles and understand all different aspects of the business. Um, and that's something that I've been able to take advantage of. So as I mentioned, Fidelity's worldwide. They're in 25 different countries on five different continents. They're headquartered out of Boston. And um, as I found, it was a, a fairly easy decision to be able to, to hop around and move around and work in different roles within the uh, organization. Um, I would say that that diversification also um, is a, a clear plan for Fidelity from a location risk, which means contingency planning. So if we ever get another tornado downtown in Salt Lake City, um, we have backups to the backups to the backups, and, and uh, our clients, uh, who are our number one priority, certainly will not go um, needing. I would say during my time at Fidelity, um, I've had, uh, as mentioned, the ability to work in uh, five different states, in four different locations, and spent about half my time back east uh, during that time with three specific years uh, in our headquarters within Boston. And during that time, um, I was uh, working mostly on project work and uh, building out strategic plans for our high net worth groups. And again, uh, as you think about what you want to do with your careers and where you want to go, I think um, I would leave you with two tips. Um, and these are going to seem quite simple. Um, these, though, have held me in good stead. I think it's uh, something that you have to have uh, as a basis or a foundation as you move forward. And if you can stay true to a couple of, of tips for success, um, then you're going to find yourself, whether it's within your career or whether it's just in life in general, um, to be uh, on your way to success. So the two tips I would leave you with are, um, number one, always have a positive attitude. You will find that positive attitude draws everyone like a magnet. You'll have leaders who would rather do business with you. You'll have uh, your peers, associates, family, whoever it might be. They are going to be drawn to that enthusiasm and energy and that go to get them attitude. The second thing I would say is embrace the opportunities. And the reason I say that is um, there will not always be 
the opportunities that you find uh, will not always be what maybe you want, right? You might be asked to do things that uh, are not what you were looking to do, and, uh, but if you embrace those opportunities, you put your best foot forward, you look for those opportunities to shine, you identify the gaps, you build solutions, you, what you're doing during the course of that time is really making yourself invaluable. And if you can do those two things, um, they will, like I said, hold you in very good stead as you build your career and uh, throughout your life. And with that, I'll have Corlers take over. Thank you. I was happy to get this job. I was still in high school. And about all I could do there was wash dishes. I didn't have any skills. I didn't have any experience, so I would wash dishes. And I got to wear a white t-shirt. Just like much of the kitchen staff, I had to wear a white t-shirt. I didn't want to wear the white t-shirt, though, because there were other shirts available. There was the red shirts for the trainers. There were the green shirts for the servers and those black shirts that the managers wore. And I really wanted a red shirt. I wanted to be a trainer because everyone looked up to the trainers and everyone, you know, listened to what they had to say and, and did what they were told to do. And so I worked really, really hard washing dishes, tons of dishes. And I got to be a trainer. I got to be a trainer of dishwashers, but I got to be a trainer and I got to wear that red shirt. And so there began my career as a dishwasher. But then I started to think, you know, I don't want to be a dishwasher anymore. And I started to ask my friends in high school, started doing a little networking. Hey, where do you guys work at? Oh, well, I work at the mall. Oh, the mall, nice, nice. That's, that sounds good. I want to work at the mall too. What, what, what do you do there? Oh, well, I sell shoes or I sell clothing or I, uh, I work in the food court. All right, all right, so that's good. Uh, are there lots of girls there at the mall? Sure, okay, great, well, I'm in. So I found a job at the shoe store. Do any of you remember, you might not be old enough, but uh, Kinney Shoes, does that ring a bell, Kinney Shoes, for some of you? Uh, you might know their sister company, Foot Locker. Uh, they were owned by Woolworth for a time, and Woolworth for a, a long time was the world's largest corporation. But I sold shoes, and I, I started initially actually as a, as a stock boy. And so the shipments would come in, and I'd take out the shoes, and I'd sort them by style, and by gender, and by size. And eventually, I was able to get out onto the sales floor. And I sold a lot of shoes, and I found I was actually good at being a salesperson. I could convince somebody to buy the pair of shoes that they were looking for, but then also buy a different pair of shoes. Maybe one they hadn't initially been considering, but one that had kind of been in the back of their mind. And how did I do this? Well, I would talk to them. I would ask them a little bit about you know, what they do for a living, and uh, what, are, what is their family like? How many kids do they have? And then I would ask them about uh, events that were coming up. And hey, wouldn't this be a great time to get those uh, high heels that you need for that event that was coming up? And I found that I could actually position shoes pretty well. Now, that was important because I got a 2% commission on shoes. But you also had to sell the accessories. How many times do you guys go into a shoe store and they want to sell you the socks or the spray? It's because the commissions are better for that kind of stuff. And I was actually really, really good at that. But after a while, I got bored at the mall and I thought, gosh, what can I do next? So I was at a little party for shoe salesmen, right? So the shoe salesmen, they, they hang out. It's pretty cool. And uh, we, we hang out. And uh, at this party, I met this guy. And he's like, well, you know, what do you do for a living? Oh, I'm, I'm in sales. I sell shoes. He goes, oh, that's great. He goes, are you good at it? And I said, I am, actually. I, I'm one of the best salespeople. I've got a lot of shoe salesmen awards. He goes, well, you know, you, you ought to go apply at Fidelity Investments. And I said, well, what's Fidelity Investments? And he says, well, it's an investment firm. They sell stocks and bonds. Uh, they sell mutual funds, too. And I said, all right, what's a mutual fund? And he says, I don't know. But I work there. And I said, well, what do you do for Fidelity? He says, well, I'm the janitor. And I said, oh, OK, so they're hiring salespeople. Great, I'll go down there. I'll tell you, Fidelity must have been pretty desperate because they hired a shoe sales guy. I, I don't know how that happened. But uh, I'll tell you, I think what part of it was is having a great charisma, a good attitude, an interest in helping people, and they brought me on and, did, and, and helped to train me. At the same time I started Fidelity, I started work as a firefighter for Sandy City. I was a volunteer for them for five years. And I was still kind of lost in life. When I started uh, firefighting, when I started Fidelity, I was 20 years old. I was trying to figure out, what am I going to do with my career? What, 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 what excites me? And uh, I did firefighting for about uh, five years, hoping that I would get hired on full time. And I took a lot of tests. And I did it with my brother, just so I could connect with him a little bit. And one time we were on this firefighter call, my brother and I were both shoved up into this attic. And the attic was filled full of smoke, and there was fire, and, and it was hot. 
and uh, I was crawling across the rafters one by one, and somehow I, I fell through part of the roof, and I was hanging on by the rafters. I was above the garage, and it knocked my mask off, and I was sucking in this smoke, and I'm like, this sucks. What am I doing? This isn't right for me. It's probably right for a lot of people. I, I like the emergency medicine piece of it. I like being an EMT, but I'm sucking smoke right now. This maybe isn't right for me. Maybe there's something else for me that's out there. And about that time, I started considering really making financial planning my career. And there's a lot of things that you can do in financial planning. It's a lot of fun. The financial services industry is an exciting. It's a fast-paced uh, environment. Whether you're interested in being a financial advisor or not, there are all sorts of jobs available in this industry. Are you good at management? Are you good at IT? Maybe you're good at compliance and following laws. Maybe you want to be an attorney. Perhaps you want to work in human resources. All of these jobs are available in the financial services industry, and they're right here. Perhaps you're the type that wants to manage a mutual fund one day. Perhaps you, know, you, you want to service the accounts of the company's clients. Maybe you don't want to sell at all. Maybe what you want to have is, is a, just a good salary and you don't want a commission. Well, we've got jobs for you. You want to work full-time or part-time? The industry has jobs for you. You want to sell 401k plans and 403b plans to storied institutions like UVU or major corporations? We've got those jobs. You want to do a ton of traveling? We've got those jobs too. We have about every type of job that you can imagine in the financial services industry. Certainly the more willing you are to be mobile and leave, the, leave Utah State, the more apt you're going to rise up that corporate ladder. So kind of keep that in mind. Be, be flexible. But you don't have to leave the state. There's plenty of really great institutions right here that will work with you. Besides Fidelity, you've got Goldman Sachs, you've got Charles Schwab, TD Ameritrade, E-Trade, Wells Fargo, Zions Bank, which is headquartered here. Tons of investment uh, firm choices. Like most careers, you might have to start out in an entry-level position. So an entry-level position, the one I started out with, was on the phones. I'd get on the phones, they'd give me a little headset, uh, and back then we didn't have workstations, it was really just this little green terminal, it was like something out of, a, out of an old-fashioned movie, and you just, you know, you just click and try to send prospectuses as clients would call, call in. So that's what I do, clients would call in and say, hey, you know, I'm interested in XYZ fund, can you send me the prospectus? Yes, I can, sir, and can I sell you some accessories with that? I brought what I learned from selling shoes, the training I got from Fidelity, and I took all of that and I started to sell a lot of mutual funds. And I was doing such a great job on it that eventually my career um, took off. Today, um, you know, I, uh, I work as a vice president regional planning consultant for Fidelity. So what does that mean? Essentially, I'm responsible for the sales of financial services products in three different branches here in Salt Lake, Orem, and in Boise. Now, I do a lot of traveling. How many of you have done some traveling before for work? A little bit? Maybe some of you? Okay, good. And traveling is a ton of fun. I love to travel. It's great. I'll, sell you, I'll, I'll share with you one traveling road warrior story. So I was flying in really late to Seattle, Washington, and I had a client meeting the very next morning. And I didn't make a reservation for a hotel because I figured, oh, I'll get one. There's usually plenty of hotels. But at that time, there was a major convention on it, and I couldn't find a hotel. Now, my flight landed at 11 o'clock. I checked Red Lion, I checked Marriott, nothing. And so about 12.30, I roll into downtown Seattle, and there's this little vacancy sign, you know, kind of glimmering. And it's at the King's Motel in Seattle, the King's Motel. One of those old-fashioned hotels with the exterior doors, barbed wire, fenced all the way around. And uh, the, the, the office was just out in the parking lot, and, you know, there was that window and the big thick glass. And I went up there and said, hey, have you guys got any rooms at all? Any? He's like, yeah, actually, I actually got a room for you, no problem. So he, uh, he let me go up to the upstairs, and I got into the room, and uh, I just remembered, oh, I've got I've to iron my shirt. I've got to press my shirt because I, I've got this client meeting in the morning. So I'm like, oh, I'm so tired. It's already 1 o'clock, uh, but I'll go ahead and iron. Well, there's no iron in the room. So I walk down to the office and say, hey, you guys got any irons and an ironing board? He's like, oh, yeah, yeah, let me get you one. So he comes out of the back, and he hands me a little mini ironing board and an iron, and I go upstairs, and... I heat up the iron, I, I lay my shirt out on the ironing board, and I just, I take that thing and, and, I, and I drag it across the back of my shirt, and all of a sudden, just this sludge was being baked into the back of my sh shirt, the exact shape of an iron with a tail. And I'm like, oh my gosh, what am I gonna do now? This thing looks horrible. I think someone was pressing grilled cheese sandwiches 
with this. I'm pretty sure that's what it was. But I had a client meeting at 8 o'clock. There was no retail sh shops open. I was stuck. So the next morning, thankfully, I had a jacket. I had to wear that stinky, yucky shirt all day at this client, client meeting. I still made the sell, but I came back with this permanent pressed iron on the back of my shirt. Let me ask you a question while we're on the subject of pressing. Why do ironing boards make that sound? Why do they make that sound? You know that sound? What? Why do they do that? Why do ironing boards make that sound? You know, I get, I get in late to some hotels sometimes, and I'll be there, and it'll be really late, and I've got to press my shirt, and I've got to open that ironing board. Now, I know if I open this ironing board, I'm going to get a call from the front desk, or it's going to wake up the neighbor next door, but why do they make that sound? So I pull the iron out of my, ironing, my, my closet, and I sort of open it just to, you know, I want to open it quietly, but that doesn't help. It's like, ee, ee, ee. Why, why do they do that? So, you know, maybe another time what I'll do is I'll try, you know, just you know, ripping the thing open, like taking off a Band-Aid. So I try that. Really loud. It's like 20 decibels higher. I don't understand why they do that. So the next time I travel, I get in late. There's the ironing board, right? It's looking at me. It's saying, hey, what's up? Remember me? I'm the one that screamed like a little boy being chased like a dog the last time you were here. I'm ready, man. Let's go. So I rip open that iron board and I iron. But I don't know why. It's the 21st century, is it not? Why do ironing boards make those sounds? So you will have your own fun travel adventures when you're in this industry. So how do you prepare? Let's talk about how you prepare for your financial services career. Do financial services still hire shoe salesmen? Let's just say that the environment has become more competitive, more competitive than ever. Many firms are looking for individuals with degrees in finance, in business, and accounting. But any degree will really do. The, the purpose of the degree is we want to know that you're prepared, you've taken tests, you've been um, sort of in the academic environment. We want to know that you can learn new ideas. This is why you go to college, okay? Most firms will prefer that you have at least two years of college before you apply with them. This is not true in every case, but I know that Fidelity does. We want you to have that career. Uh, we want you to know that if you don't finish your college, we expect that you're going to do that. And in fact, many of the institutions that you could work for will pro provide you with tuition reimbursement policies. So that's something to think about. Most firms are looking for someone who is self-driven motivated, and motivated to achieve their dreams, and will work hard. And as Lori said, having an outgoing personality helps you more than you could ever possibly know. In entry-level positions, you're not expected to already have your licenses. Most uh, of the job training uh, that will be provided to you will train you to get your licenses, will educate you, will pay for the licensing in most situations. So don't worry about all of that initially. Of course, if you already have these licenses, it certainly gives you a leg up in some situations. In financial services, and this is really, really important, we expect you to have a clean criminal record. Have a good credit history. Now, why is that important? We're going to check your credit. Every institution does it. We want to make sure that you can handle your own finances before we let you handle the finances of somebody else. And don't do drugs. Okay? Very important. So I'm going to end there, and I'm going to bring up Rob Witt, who's going to talk a little bit about the Fidelity Investments uh, Orem Center and talk a little bit about management. But I hope this has been helpful and hopefully a little fun for you uh, as you uh, sit here as required. So thank you very much. As a manager, I've uh, been in management at Fidelity and sales management type positions for the last four or five years. I'll talk about the best sales representatives I've seen, the best representatives I've seen. What are some of the three characteristics or qualities that they have that I'd like to instill in you and hopefully that you can those are some qualities that you can take with you as you enter the workforce. So for me, I, I as you heard from my introduction, I, my degree, undergraduate degree was in communication studies. I wanted to be a sports journalist. I watched ESPN every night and thought that would be cool to get in front of the camera and talk sports all day long. That's got to be the coolest job ever. Well, when you start looking at it, if any of you have done that, you start in fun towns like uh, maybe Boise, Idaho. If I can, is anybody from Boise? Hope I'm not uh, ripping on anybody's hometown, but 
You start in a, a luxurious location like a Boise, Idaho, or a Butte, Montana, and you have to work in the local station first, and you work your way up, and you really don't get paid that much money. And uh, at the time, I just uh, I, we'd been married a few years, and we're uh, getting ready to have our first child, and um, moving around to luxurious locations like that to try to work my way up just wasn't appealing. I was working at a credit union and had a college roommate tell me about Fidelity. And so I hired on at Fidelity, mainly because it paid more than I was making, and it was a, it was a good wage. So started at, at Fidelity, like Lori mentioned, we're open around the clock. So my first role at Fidelity, I was on the phones, like Carlos, taking phone calls, and my shift, I would get to work at 5 o'clock in the evening and work until 3.30 in the morning. So as you might imagine, we had some pretty interesting calls, but there was also... It's not too busy at 3 o'clock in the morning. Not a whole lot of calls coming in, but we were going to be there 24 hours a day, so we were there. So for me, it was a great opportunity to actually spend some time, read the Wall Street Journal, um, get online, look at, look at different news stories, learn about Fidelity's policies and procedures, learn about retirement accounts, and really just use that time to acquire knowledge. I was able to finish school using the tuition reimbursement at Fidelity and ultimately get my MBA degree while at Fidelity. And it was taking that, that first step where, again, it was to help pay for school and pay the bills, and that was about it. A few years later, I was in a position, and the last couple positions I've had have been in sales management, also working with uh, in education, where I've gone out to companies to present to executives and to employees to talk about retirement planning. And what I found was we as Americans are underprepared for retirement. There was a study that I saw, I saw last year that was put out. It was um, put up by McKinsey and Company. And what it told us was Americans are on track as a whole to only have about 63% of the income they need in retirement. So for me, I was shocked by that. But meeting with lots of individuals, I could see how that could be the case. A lot of people, not only had the market just tanked and people that had money invested had a lot less than they had before, but people weren't, aren't saving enough. There was actually a period of time in the mid-2000s where the savings rate in America was dipped below zero, so it was negative. So Americans as a whole were spending more than we made. And that's the point where, for me, being able to help people help them plan for retirement so that they wouldn't have to work into their 70s and 80s. That's what got me up in the morning, and that got me real excited and really helped me decide to change this job into a career. The one experience that I had, this happened a few years ago. Um, it was, I think it was 2002. There was a lady I was talking to. I was working the phone site at the time. And there was a lady I was speaking to who lived just outside of Pittsburgh, and she was just over 60, almost 60 and a half. And she called in, and she was getting ready to retire. And I thought, man, how exciting. This is cool. So we started talking through it, and as I ran the numbers for her, we looked at the numbers, and they told us that she, her assets would only last until she was about age 67. And she wasn't in great health, but still, 67 was not going to cut it. As a financial planner, I t you know, we took a step back. We looked at things, and... I, unfortunately, that's not a fun message to deliver, but it's one that is needed to be delivered. So talk to her about the fact that she wasn't going to be on track to retire. And I let her, she obviously was pretty emotional about from that, and we decided, you know what, let, let me give you a week to digest this, and let's talk in a week and kind of see what you, you're thinking, see what you want to do. So when I called her back the next week, totally different story. She was happy, upbeat, and you know, I asked why you know, why the sudden change of heart? Why are you so excited that you have to work longer? She said, you know what? Now I know that I need to work another three years. And if I work another three years, then because Social Security kicking in at that point, I'm going to be fine. My home will be uh, closer to being paid off at that point. I'll be able to make it work in three years. And now that I know that, I know the light at the end of the tunnel. I know how long it is. I can deal with anything for three years. And so she was exciting. And so for me, that was that fulfillment that comes from helping somebody really plan for retirement, but plan wisely so they don't make mistakes. The worst thing, if you, when you look at the statistics, there was a Wall Street Journal article 
a couple years ago that came out that talked about the biggest fear that Americans have. And it's not death, it's not snakes, it's not mice or whatever. The biggest fear is speaking in public. So that's, that's number one. Number two is actually um, running out of money in retirement. And so people fear that more than death itself. Because what's worse, if you run out of money in retirement, what are you going to do? What do you have to live off of? What do you, what do you have to look forward to? So that's a, something for me that really made this uh, job a career. I'm trying to... F so we're going to hop on now. I want to actually show you what it might look like if you were to plan, when you get out into the workforce, how much money you might need when you retire. Let's see if this works. Oh, I'll just... Okay, this isn't pulling up, so let's talk about it then. So if you're age 25 entering the workforce, and let's say you're going to get a job making $35,000, $40,000 a year, and you're going to work for 40 years. Anybody want to guess what we're going to estimate that you're going to need for retirement? Oh, there we go. We'll wait for this to... Is that in focus? No, not really. So if it, for a 25-year-old making about thirty-five dollars to $40,000 a year, by the time you're age 65 and want to retire, you're going to need about $2 million to be able to maintain your lifestyle in retirement. Does that surprise anyone? That's a big number, right? $2 million bucks. Who's, how are you going to save $2 million? But it happens little by little, and it happens by starting early. The, that $2 million figure, I think, you know, for people retiring now is obviously a lot less because they don't have 40 years still of inflation to deal with. But when you're starting early, if you start with this little 10% of your salary a year and more and more companies are offering a match on the 401k so that when you do that, you're actually getting a little bit from the company. And there, there's this magical thing that... Uh, Einstein actually called it one of the greatest inventions of mankind, which is compound interest. That your earnings start to earn money. And so by the time you hit those later years, if you save about 10% of your salary, starting off at age 25, you do it for 40 years. And we have an average market scenario, you're actually going to end up with about $3.2 million. So you'll have a million dollars to spare, right? A million ahead of what you might need. But if you wait five years to do that, so if you wait till age 30, let's say, you put it off five years, because of that compound interest and the fact that that growth, if you ever look at one of those growth calculators, it's exponential. So the later years is when you have the most growth. If you wait five years, you lose out on a million bucks. When in reality, what you're doing up front is it's only about $4,000 a year for the first five years. Or twenty thousand bucks that you're not putting in makes a difference of a million bucks down the road. It's that sort of the, that sort of message that we're able to provide and to give to our clients to help them understand the value of planning early and the importance of planning early, and that it's really something that if you if you're consistent with it over the long run, will uh, end up being a good thing. The last thing I'm going to end with are some takeaways that I've seen from the most successful employees that I've managed and worked with over the years. The first is there's no substitute for hard work. And you've probably heard it a million times and I hope you hear it a million more times because at the end of the day hard work is the thing that's going to set you apart because in today's society with the, everybody has the internet at work, people hop on YouTube, Facebook, by the time you look at somebody's 40-hour work week the average employee probably hasn't worked close to 40 hours because they've spent time doing other things. But if you put in an honest day's work and put in your 40 hours, maybe sometimes it'll be 50 or 60 hours during busy periods of time. But if you truly come to work and enjoy what you do in the long run, that's something that's going to set you apart from the, the others that don't, maybe won't take it as seriously. The second is take ownership of your own development. And what I mean by that is for those of you that are thinking about the business school and the MBA program, we talk a lot about 
creating a business plan for new businesses in the MBA program. For you, you need to create your own business plan. You are your own company. So take the time to go through and figure out what you want to accomplish. And just like a business would, figure out what results you want. Figure out what activities or inputs you are going to need to get the results that you want. And then hold yourself accountable to that. Because that's something that the representatives I've seen that have been most successful have had, you can call it goals, you can call it a development plan, a business plan, whatever you want to call it. They have a document that they use every day that keeps them honest, that keeps them on track. They don't just wing it when you get into the workforce. And part of that process is going to be find a mentor at whatever company. It can be outside your company, inside the company you work for. Find someone who you can look up to and you know, it's great to have a good boss and good coworkers, but it's better to have somebody outside the company or in a different part of the company that you trust implicitly. Somebody that you can have confidence in that will help give you that direction. And that relates to the third bullet point or the takeaway, which is actively seek feedback. Go out to people and ask them how you're doing. Ask your boss how you're doing. What can you do different to improve and get better? And when people come to you with feedback and ways to improve, don't resist the urge to be defensive about it. And to say, you know, put up the, the, the blocks and say, no, no, that's not me. You want to be open about and understand what you can do to improve. Because the day you stop asking for feedback and getting feedback is the day that your progress stops. Because you're no longer in a position to uh, find out what you can do better. So again, hard work. And I'll equate schooling right along with that hard work. You know, as, as you're working your tail off right now in school, studying, maybe working a job at the same time, take it seriously. Because it, every ounce of energy you put into it will help on the back end. Take ownership of your own development and actively seek feedback. And I'll actually tie those in because I think Lori's two takeaways were excellent as well. The, have a positive attitude and embrace the opportunities that you have. And with those five things, I think those that, that can really make a difference in your own progress as you look to enter the workforce or if you're already in the workforce to hopefully help it, uh, expedite your career. So we've got just a few minutes now where we'll actually take some time to, uh, for Q&A. That, does that work? So what questions do you have for any of the three of us? So the question was, what's the difference between a Fidelity and an Edward Jones? Really, is we're both in the business of financial planning and helping customers invest their money and invest wisely. Uh, the, really, it's a difference of the business structure. Fidelity has, hundred, I think, 150 branches with the ones we've opened in the last few weeks. Edward Jones, last count, had over 11,000 branches. So there's are small branches with two, th couple employees at the most in each branch whereas the Fidelity branches typically have anywhere from 6 to 20. To, yeah, there are branches with as many as 30 or 40 employees at Fidelity. Um, so for them, it's more grassroots. They're going out on a local level. A lot of their prospecting is done going door to door to uncover prospects and to, to find leads. Whereas with Fidelity, you call it the big green machine because of Fidelity's colors. But you have Fidelity, which really supplies our branches and our, our financial planners with leads so they don't have to go door to door or cold call. So, good question. What else? Yes? Do you have corporate too, or just personal Cor So, is there corporate investing as well as personal? The, both. Fidelity is the largest 401k provider in the, con in the country, uh, as well as helping individuals invest. And then co corporations too, if they just have corporate cash or something that they want to invest on their own, they can obviously do that through an account at Fidelity or really any other broker out there can help with those types of accounts. What else? Thanks. Yes? What, what is Fidelity's marketing strategy to, to get younger people in? Because you said that you should start young at 25, but a lot of times when I see commercials of similar companies, they're, they seem targeted to an older demographic. Mm -hmm. That's a great question. When you think about the, like you said, most advertising is about retirement and folks that are getting close to retirement. 
Fidelity, part of that, if you, if you watch football on Sundays on CBS, we have the, the green line, which is targeted somewhat younger, but not quite to the 20-year-old or the, the person uh, just getting started. But we do have some other um, Simple Start IRA, which is designed for folks that are just, you know, maybe with as little as, what is it, $25, you can open an IRA and start putting in 25 bucks every month. So there are some things there designed for that. Um, but, I, you know, I think what you see with Fidelity is, as well as every other company out there, to be honest, you know, they're, a lot of their focus is on that older generation where the, the baby boomer generation, because that's where the, uh, when you look at the opportunity as far as wealth, that's where the wealth is. So they're going to focus on that when the reality is the folks that probably need it the most are the folks in their 20s, the, because they're the ones that need to hear the message the most. So it's probably underserved. A lot of the marketing efforts for Fidelity, uh, you probably won't see it from a television standpoint. You're going to see a lot of it based on cutting edge technology for the younger crowd. So um, the iPad, uh, iPad app, if you're an iPad user, really fun app. There's a lot of active trader tools out there and other things on uh, fid.com, which is, um, you know, uh, smart money named it the number one online uh, service. Um, piece. So it's going to be more geared towards that rather than necessarily the broad-based ads that are going after a bigger audience. Good question. What other questions? Right there. Do you guys um, manage funds for poor people or like, how does that work? Is that like American funds? Yeah, yeah. So there are, are Fidelity has a couple hundred of their of our own proprietary mutual funds where somebody puts their money in. We have services, fee fee based services for folks that want to have us manage it for them. There are actually mutual funds that are called fund of funds that will have a mix of stock funds and bond funds, and really they're designed as a all in one type solution. And then there's also we you're able to get. Uh, and have access to non-fidelity mutual funds, over 4,000 non-fidelity mutual funds like a Janus or a Vanguard through Fidelity. And that's pretty common. Most brokerage houses out there will do the same thing where you can access other companies' mutual funds through, the, through their, their platform. The lessons learned again, hard work, taking ownership, actively seeking feedback, embracing positive or attaining a positive attitude and embracing change. And Carlos, I'll never travel without WD-40 again. <laughs> if we can have each of the speakers come up, we have a small gift for each of you.